Hello and welcome to this video, in which we'll sew together the Berlin pattern. This is a pattern for both pants and shorts for women in sizes 32 to 52. Let's start with the pants. The basic inspiration for the pants is the carrot shape, recognizable by its ample volume at the hips and top of the leg, and a slightly tighter lower leg. The waist is high and rather marked. We've reinterpreted the carrot shape in our own way, to offer you a comfortable, casual pattern with a masculine feminine effect. The shape is wide at the hips and tapers gently to the ankles without being tight, while the lower legs are finished with facing for a chic look. The length is 7 eighths. We could, of course, do a cuff at the bottom too. The waistband has belt loops so you can accessorize with fancy belts. Of course, you can leave the belt loops off. It opens with a non-separable nylon or metal zipper. The originality of this model lies in the shape of the front and back pockets, which are applied to the pants with a bias binding. The shorts are loose-fitting with a high waist. The legs are rather short, finished with a wide facing that gives the bottom of the garment a nice hold. Other features are identical to those of the pants. Waistband with belt loops, button and zipper opening, patch pockets with bias opening. The waistband of the pants and shorts is finished with a bias binding, and the fly can be binded as an option. The skill level is intermediate. The main technical points of this pattern are the zipper, the bias binding at the waistband, and the patch pockets. This requires precision to get a nice finish. But as usual, you'll see that if you take your time, and are precise about the ironing and assembly, it goes without saying. In the same way, the choice of fabric can have a big influence on the difficulty. For a beginner, we prefer a stable fabric that marks well with the iron. Let's talk about the choice of fabric. This pattern is designed for warp and weft, meaning woven rather than knitted fabrics. You can use just about anything, with or without a little ella stain. We can use rather fine summer fabrics such as chambray, linen or fine canvas. You can also use gabardine, baby corduroy or ribbed velvet, denim or flannel. Jacquard is also an option, particularly for shorts. However, avoid weights over 380 grams per square meter, which would be too thick for these pants. In terms of supplies, you'll need a 15 cm non-separable zipper with nylon spiral chains or metal chains. You'll also need an 18, 20 or 22 mm button or a 17 mm diameter snap, a bias binding for the bottom of the waistband and, optionally, for the fly placket. This bias binding should be 28 mm wide when unfolded and 7 mm when folded to avoid interfering with assembler seams. You can take a wider bias binding and trim it easily. I'll show you how later in the video. Finally, you'll need some fine fusible interfacing for the waistband and fly placket. Fine woven type, for example G700 from Vlies line. You'll also need polyester sewing thread for its strength. And, as an option, a denim thread or an extra strong thread for thicker materials such as denim or gabardine. Machine needles must be adapted to the material used. 90 to 100 gauge universal needles or denim needles. Let's take a look at some of the different sewn versions to see some different renderings. First, we have a pair of Atelier Brunette Gabardine pants in rust in size 40, 350 grams per square meter, an ideal weight for these pants in the spring, autumn or winter half season. For midsummer, I'd recommend a thinner 240 grams per square meter gabardine, as shown here on the prototype I sewed during pattern development. I also sewed these size 36 denim pants with contrasting orange stitching, a khaki colored bias binding, and a button from our Ikati button collection. Finally, I sewed size 36 shorts in khaki corduroy with tone on tone stitching, a gray bias binding, and another tortoise shell button. I mistakenly shifted the front loops just a bit. They're normally symmetrical with the crotch in front. The fly is designed with a left opening. 
If you'd like to make the fly with the opening the other way around, you can. In this case, cut the fly placket piece in the other direction first and reverse the legs at the fly release. You'll also need to reverse the fly placket assemblies as described in the video. Before we start assembling the garment, we'll look at a specific point on cutting the pots. You need to cut all the pieces of your pants or shorts option. On the front leg, there's a fly release for the fly and placket. This fly release is for the left leg when worn only. It needs to be ray cut for the right leg when worn, as I've already done here. I've cut the strip one centimeter wide. Then you need to raise all the mockings, making a small notch with scissors in the edges of the belts, front and back legs. More specifically for the back legs, there are also mockings for fitting the pocket and forming the back dart. You mark either with a textile pen or chalk, as I'm doing here on the denim version. I'll also trace the dart fold lines. Alternatively, you can mark the marks as I've done here with a base thread that I've threaded through the pattern paper, tied with a simple knot and recut. This way, your mockers will be clearly visible and the thread can be easily removed with small embroidery scissors. Here are all my back leg mockers done, the top of the pockets and the end of the back dart on each leg. In this case too, I need to chalk the fold lines of the back darts. We continue preparing the pieces by interfacing only certain parts. Out of fabric waistband pieces, fly and fly placket only, are interfaced on the wrong side. We now move on to overcasting, which I had already done on my side. This overcasting can be done either with the zigzag stitch on the sewing machine or with the overcasting of the serger. We're going to overcast the pieces as I'm showing you here. The outlines of the pieces in general, except for the top of the pockets, which will be enclosed in an inset, and the single height of the passing pieces. You might not want to overcast or overlock the lower legs or the top or bottom of the facing pieces, as the seams will be enclosed in the end. However, fabrics often fray quite a bit during the making. Personally, I like to overcast almost all the edges, so I've done that here. The next step is to iron the pieces. I chose to group as many ironings as possible at the start, so as to do as much as possible in one go. I like to do it this way, because it's more efficient to iron the pieces one after the other while the iron is still hot, and once the pieces are ironed, all that's left to do is sew. We'll start with the facing on the lower legs. We'll iron a one centimeter inset at the top of each piece. This is the longest width, as I've already done here. Then we mark the hems of the pocket tops. The first tuck in is one centimeter, then the second is three centimeters. I use my ironing ruler, which is very handy and allows me to iron my hems precisely. Then I mark one centimeter tucks on the sides and bottom of the pockets for the back pockets and on the bottom and long side of the front pocket. Next, I mark the back dart by first aligning the two dart markers right sides together, then stick a pin in the bottom dart marker to help me mark the end of the pleat. I iron a fold to the dart end mark. I mark the shape of the dart with a pin and textile pen or chalk, which I stitch later. I repeat it on the other leg with the other back dart. Finally, I'm going to fold each belt loop from sides together in thirds, starting with the height that isn't overcast if you have one that isn't overcast, unlike me, who overcast everything. Then fold the other height over the first to enclose it. Iron to mark the folds. The iron will still be needed as the pants or shorts are assembled, but the main part is done. We finish preparing the pieces by trimming the bias binding strips for the bottom of the inner waistband and to tuck in the fly placket as an option. We need a bias binding width of 7mm folded, meaning 28mm open. If you have a wider commercial bias binding, iron the bias binding open and reduce its width to 28mm by cutting, then fold in two and iron. Fold the lengths again in two to obtain a folded 7mm bias binding. We performed the darts at the top of the back pieces, 
matching the two marks' right sides together, and ironed. A fold formed nicely on the wrong side of the piece. I pinned from start to finish. All that remains is to stitch in straight stitch along the mark to form the dart, which I've already done on my side. We'll then iron the dart to the outside of the leg, and I'll hold it in place with a few top stitches in the seam allowances, which I've already done on my side of the other leg. But on your side, you'll need to repeat on the other back leg in symmetry. Here's what the shaped and plated darts look like on the pants version, but also on the shorts version. From now on, I'll focus on the assembly of the denim pants. Assembly is exactly the same for shorts, and I'll show you the result on the shorts too at each stage. Now we can start forming the top pocket hems. Turn right sides together and press the three centimeters tuck on the top of one of the front pockets. The first one centimeter tuck is held in place wrong sides together. Then I'll pin to the vertical edge on the inside of the pocket, not the curved side, and stitch with a straight stitch one centimeter into the seam allowances, only on the highest side, which I've already done here on the other symmetrical pocket. I'll then trim the seam allowances close to the seam without cutting it, and I'll also trim in the layers. Then mark the corner with the nails and turn the pocket top hem wrong sides together. I'll use the tip of my scissors or, better still, a punch to mark the point. I finish by ironing the shaped point and the hem. I didn't stitch on the other side of the pocket, as I want to leave the seam allowances flat. The pocket is placed along the edge of the applied leg, and keeping the margins flat means less thickness at this point. Back to the pocket top hem, which I still need to top stitch at 28 millimeters from the top, which I've done on my side here. We'll repeat the operation, but with the back pockets this time, marking the tucks, folding with the small tuck made, and pinning. The only difference from the front pockets is that we'll stitch the top hem on both sides this time, as I've already done on one of the pockets here. I'll then strip and turn right side out, iron and repeat on the other back pocket in symmetry. Here are the back pockets prepared for the two versions. I'll iron the side and bottom folds at one centimeter if necessary. I'll start with the back pockets on the back legs. I place the wrong side of a back pocket on the right side of the back leg according to the mockings. Then I carefully pin the pocket. I then stitch the sides and bottom of the pocket in a single top stitch three millimeters from the edge of the pocket, starting with a back and fourth stitch at the top opening of the pocket. When I reach the opposite end of the pocket top, I make two parallel stitches at the top edge of the pocket and bring the stitch down parallel to the stitch already made. Finish with an out and back stitch, arriving at the initial stitch. I'll show you the stitch path I followed on the pocket. I started down there, left the needle planted and lifted the presser foot of the machine to turn my work, then lowered the foot and continued down, marked the angle again, etc. I extended the stitch parallel to the first stitch, finishing here with back and forth stitches. Repeat with the other pocket in symmetry on the other back leg. Before stitching the second pocket, check the symmetry by, for example, measuring the distance to the edge of the top and bottom of the pocket. Sometimes you'll find that you've shifted a little and you'll be in for a surprise when worn. Here are the back pockets sewn on the two versions. Moving on to placing the front pockets on the front legs. Beforehand, we ironed one centimeter folds at the bottom and on the longest side of the front pockets. I'll place a front pocket along the side of the front leg according to the mockings. Carefully pin all the way around. Stitch the pocket starting with a stop stitch at the top of one side, then continue stitching down, as for the back pockets. Finish with back and forth stitches at the top of the pocket. Here's the result on the other symmetrical pocket I've already sewn. On your side, you'll need to repeat on the other leg with the other symmetrical front pocket. Here's the result on the two versions. Our front pockets are in place. This is one of the trickiest pots of your pants or shorts, as poorly fitted patch pockets are not forgivable. 
Don't hesitate to sew and unstitch if your pockets aren't quite symmetrical or if the point isn't quite right. Now it's time to assemble the fly and zipper. If you haven't already done so, we'll mark the stitch stop mark on the front legs at fly level. Then I'll align the two front legs right sides together and pin from the stitch stop to the bottom of the crotch. All that's left is to stitch at a distance of one centimeter, starting from the stopper stitch. Optionally, I can reinforce the seam with a second stitch aligned with the first. There, it's sewn, iron the seams open. As an option, the curved edge of the fly piece can be edged with a folded 7mm bias binding straddling the edge. I would point out that this edging will result in a greater thickness and that this finish is recommended for experienced seamstresses or those who have a machine that can handle thicker fabrics. Otherwise, prefer the simple finish of overcasting without bias binding. Returning to our edging, I open my bias binding and align it with right sides together along the curved part of the fly. I pin all the way and stitch in the groove seven millimeters from the edge. That's it, once stitched. Trim the excess bias binding at the bottom of the fly. You could even notch in the curves to facilitate turning in the most curved part. Then fold the bias binding over the edge and I align the edge with the tuck-in made to cover the previously made stitching that I see on the wrong side of the fly piece. Pin carefully and stitch with a straight stitch two millimeters from the edge of the bias binding on the right side to ensure even stitching. That's it, stitched, I've trimmed the end flush. This denim version has an edged fly placket. Alternatively, leave the edge curved without bias binding, but with a well-surfaced edge, as is the case here for my corduroy version. I spread the left leg when worn to help me work on the right leg. We'll align the fly right sides together with the right front leg when worn, the one without the fly release. The top and side edges are aligned. I'll pin along the fly to the stop point, meaning one centimeter from the bottom of the fly. The one centimeter seam allowances at the bottom of the fly are not included in the pinning. I'll then stitch from the top to the bar tack, one centimeter from the edge. Once stitched, I notch the fly seam allowances at the tack level, then press the seam open. We've also pressed the seam open at the fly level, and I'll understitch the fly with the fly seam allowance only, stitching the two layers together two millimeters from the seam. Once stitched, I'll fold the fly wrong sides together under the right leg and press. I don't hesitate to cut and trim the end of the fly in the seam allowances, as I'm doing here with the bias binding that I'm cutting to avoid extra thickness. Here's the result on the other version, already ironed. Fold the fly under placket in two right sides together, stitch the bottom one centimeter from the edge. I've done this here on the corduroy version. I'll strip the seam allowances. Next, Turn the under placket inside out on the right side and press. I'll take the zipper and open it. I'll align the zipper's reverse braid along the right side of the underlay, overcast side. The top of the zipper teeth should be 1.5 cm from the top edge. I'll pin, then stitch 5 mm from the zipper teeth with a special zipper presser foot. At the zipper puller, leave the needle planted in the fabric. Lift the presser foot, slide the puller behind the presser foot, lower the foot, continue stitching. Here's how it looks on each version. Now I'm going to spread the right leg when worn to work on the left leg. I'll align the underlap with right sides together along the left leg fly release, so the zipper is sandwiched. I'll wedge the top of the underlap to the top of the fly release, and I'll pin the long side. I now need to stitch through the layers from top to bottom of the fly release along the teeth using a special zipper presser foot. I'll stitch exactly on the previous stitch. As before, I stop before reaching the cursor, leave the needle planted, lift the presser foot, pass the cursor behind the foot and lower the foot to resume my stitching. It's stitched on the denim version and on the corduroy version, I'll unfold the underlay. Press flat and top stitch the left leg along the zipper teeth through the layers using a zipper foot. 
Here's the result on the two versions. I'll close the zipper, then stitch the under placket to the fly, aligning them at the top. I'll lift the under placket to pin the other zipper braid in place on the fly only. The right leg isn't caught in the pinning, bordering a bit roughly as it's not super practical to do. Once the zip braid is in place, I'll open the zip, spread the under flap by folding right sides together the two legs together and finish pinning the zip braid to the fly, making sure that the braid is parallel to the fly edge all the way and that the top of the teeth are 1.5 centimeters from the top edge of the fly. From the top, stitch the braid and fly close enough to the teeth at about 6 millimeters, still using the special zipper presser foot. That's it. I'll show you how it looks on the corduroy version first, then on the denim version. I'll fold the fly over to the wrong side of the leg, then pin together the fly and the right leg so I can draw the final top stitching of the fly precisely. To do this, I place the top stitching template in line with the top and edge of the fly allowing me to draw the top stitching along the other edge and bottom of the template with a textile pen or chalk. Once this is done, I'll remove the template. I'll spread the under placket and left leg and top stitch the fly and right leg along the outline. I'll start and finish with a stop stitch. You often can't go all the way down the fly. You stop as soon as you get stuck and stitch back and forth. This is how it looks. To finish the fly, I'm going to reposition the under placket under the fly and on the right side of the pants slash shorts, and I'm going to do a board and stitch, very tight zigzag, through all the layers and at the bottom of the fly at the level of the top stitching previously done or a little lower. I had quite a few layers. If your machine can't do the zigzag stitch back and forth, shift the stitching a little lower or higher. These extra thicknesses will be especially tricky for the bias binding fly version. Finally, on the wrong side, I'm going to machine stitch a holding stitch back and forth between the under placket and the fly at the fly's rounding. Voila, the zippers of my two versions are sewn and these zippers assembled. For the corduroy version with the fly finished by a simple overcast, I had no trouble making the zigzag stitch at the end of the zipper assembly. It was trickier with the denim version with edging due to the thicker zipper bottoms. To start assembling the legs, align the front and back leg sides right sides together. I'll pin all the way through and stitch at one centimeter. Once stitched, I open the seam with an iron and repeat on the other leg, as I did here on the jeans version and then on the corduroy version of the shorts. Now we've sewn the sides, we're going to align the back crotch of the right and left legs together, right sides together. I'm going to pin and stitch at one centimeter. It's stitched. I've also opened the seams with an iron. Here's how it looks on the two versions. To finish assembling the legs, we'll align right sides together along the inside edges of the legs, starting with the crotch seams and continuing along the legs. Stitch at one centimeter and press the seam allowances open. We'll now prepare the waistband of our pants or shorts. I start by joining the strips forming the two waistbands, the outer waistband, which is interfaced on the wrong side, and the inner waistband, which is not interfaced. For each waistband, I align the front right sides together, then the left sides together, with the right and left ends of the back waistband, pinning and stitching at one centimeter. After stitching, I ironed open the seams. I also marked a mark to differentiate the left front from the right front. The left front is longer than the right front on the outer waistband and the opposite for the inner waistband. For my part, I marked the left side when worn with a chalk cross. You could of course put a pin or textile pen mark. I've prepared my two belts on the two versions with the mockings reversed for the inner belt. We'll then tuck in the bottom edge of the inner waistband as we did previously for the fly edge. First, pin the open bias binding right sides together on the longest edge of the inner waistband. 
If, like me, you've used a bias binding that's just a little wider than 7mm when folded, you can make it protrude slightly from the waistband edge. We stitched in the groove of the open bias binding. We'll trim the bias binding at the end and the excess thickness at the seam allowances on the side seams. I'm now going to cover the bias binding edge straddling the waistband edge. I just need to barely cover the previously made seam and pin all along with lots of pins to get a nice finish. I'll then stitch on the right side 2 slosh 3 mm from the edge of the bias binding, removing the pins as I go before stitching. Here's the result on each of the two versions. I'll take care of the belt loops. I had ironed each loop with the heights folded over each other. I'll stitch through the layers at 2 slash 3 millimeters along each edge to form the loop. Repeat on the other four loops as I've already done here. I've placed the wrong side of the loops on the right side of the outer waistband. I align the top and bottom of each loop with the top and bottom edges of the outer waistband and pin carefully. One loop centered in the middle back, the others according to the mockings. Two are placed in front on either side of the opening, and two on the back between the middle and side waistband seams. Then stitch 5 mm from the top and bottom edges on the five loops. Align right sides together at the top of the outer and inner belts. Pin and stitch 1 cm from the top edge. Once stitched, I'll carefully trim off any excess thickness at the seam allowances, even at the belt loops, cutting off as much as I can. Next, press the seam open and lay the inner waistband seam allowance under the inner waistband. I'll then need to stitch the two layers at 2 mm from the seam allowances and the inner waistband which I've already done here, starting and stopping the stitching two centimeters from the ends. I'll align the ends of the outer and inner belts right sides together, pin and stitch one centimeter from the edges at the top of the belts, but stopping one centimeter from the bottom of the belts. After stitching, I trim off the corners of the seam allowances to remove thickness, then mark the corners and turn the belt right side out, leaving me to iron. Here's how it looks. I align the outer waistband with right sides together along the top of the pants slash shorts. I'll start at one end to align with the fly then continue aligning according to the mockings. Then pin the outer waistband to the top of the garment as I go. There may be a little ease, meaning a little excess material at the top of the pants or shorts, as the waistband has been interfaced and this may have contracted the waistband a little. Good pinning with lots of pins is all that's needed to reduce any gaps. All that remains is to stitch at one centimeter without catching the inner waistband in the seam. Once the stitching is done, I'll carefully trim off any excess thickness in the seam allowances, then lay the seam allowances towards the waistband and press flat. I'll now fold over and pin the inner waistband. We'll pin with the bias binding flat. The bias binding must cover the stitching done earlier anyway. And we begin pinning. We take our time to position the waistband and pins correctly. At the ends, you'll need to trim the excess thickness at the ends of the outer waistband and make a small diagonal tuck in the bias binding for a neat finish. Here too, don't hesitate to use a lot of pins to get the work well prepared before stitching, or use an iron and a punch. Finally, stitch the waistband to the right side of the garment, exactly in the same seam as the waistband. You need to spread each loop apart to avoid catching it in the seam as you go along. I advise you to go slowly so that the stitching is invisible. Here's the result on our two versions. The inside is clean. The stitching will a priori be above the bias binding. It's a little difficult to make it straight, but it's discreet, and the important thing is that it doesn't show it all on the right side. We'll now press the loops down and flatten them under the waistband, then zip tag each loop to the bottom and back. I'm showing you the corduroy version on which I've already sewn the bottom of the loops. Ideally, 
We'll spread the bias binding before sewing the bias binding back stitches, so as not to stitch the bias binding. This avoids visible stitching on the wrong side. On this side, I've lifted the bias binding, so I have a clean finish. But on the other side, I haven't, so you can see the stop stitch on the bias binding. I'm now going to attach the facing to the bottom of the legs. To do this, I first join the facing front and back together. I align facing front and back with right sides together. The back facing is longer than the front facing because the back hem is wider than the front. This is normal, as we wanted the seam to be offset a little to the front when the pants are worn. I'll stitch the ends at one centimeter and press the seams open. I'll then align right sides together and then the shortest edge of the facing at the bottom of the leg, front to front of leg and back along back leg. First pinning the leg side and facing seams together and then pinning, taking care to have the leg seams wide open. Once spinned, I stitch one centimeter all the way around. Once stitched, I'll press the seam allowances open at the skill level, then press the seam allowance open and under stitch the facing allowance and facing together to within two millimeters of the previously stitched seam. Fold the facing wrong sides together, pin with the one centimeter tuck made at the beginning of the project and stitch to form a hem spirit 3.5 centimeters from the bottom of the pants or 2.5 centimeters from the bottom of the shorts. Here's how it looks on the two legs of the pants and shorts. All that's left to do is apply the appropriate snap or, as shown here, make a horizontal button hole on the right front waistband when worn, then place the opposite button on the left waistband when worn. Your Berlin shorts and pants are now ready. We hope you found this video useful. Feel free to post your creations on Instagram with the hashtag IKTBerlin or leave a comment on the Berlin Pattern Product page. We look forward to seeing your creations. Happy sewing and see you soon at Ikati.